Words can't describe the passion that I had for flying jets, living my dream. But words also can't describe some of the fears and doubts I faced every single time I strapped into that jet to fly. So I had to deal with this fear and this phobia, this uncertainty and doubt that threatened to paralyze my ability to do what I love more than anything else. And so we're gonna talk about commitment today. Commitment number one, or wingtip number one, is commitment to excellence, to passion and drive. Now, I learned about excellence at a very early age. My dad was a mechanic at Kennedy Airport in New York City. He used to come home after a 16-hour day, working overtime to feed the family. Cuts all over his hands, grease on his uniform, smelling like jet fuel from head to toe. Love that smell. He was always preaching to the kids. Do it right the first time, but don't do it at all, was his favorite. He said, you hang out with garbage, you're gonna become garbage. Be careful who you spend time with on the weekends. The early bird gets the worm. Don't take the easy way out. Pull my finger. <laughs> so my life changed for me when dad took me and my identical twin brother Dave to Kennedy Airport when we were eight years old on a little tour. I'll never for the life of me forget jumping onto the tarmac and smelling the sweet smell of JP4 jet fuel fill my lungs, hearing the rumble of the jet engines, watching the floating birds, I was hooked. And then dad sat us in the cockpit of that 747 jumbo jet. And I started to play with the switches. I said, dad, what's this place for? He said, it's the cockpit, Rob. It's where the pilot flies the plane. And I knew in a heartbeat that I didn't want to fix the planes like my dad, I wanted to fly them. So I said, dad, I want to fly these things. What do I need to do? And he said, listen, son, you forgot. You're afraid of heights. Probably not the best career choice for you. <laughs> and I said, I don't care, Dad. I'll join the Air Force if I have to, which really ticked him off because he was a Navy vet. <laughs> and I said, I don't care, Dad. I'm going to do it. I'm going to find a way because my passion was greater than my fear. I applied to the Air Force Academy, made a commitment to step out of my comfort zone go for excellence. And I sign on the dotted line in freshman year. I show up to swim class, and in the corner of that brand spanking new Olympic-sized swimming pool was this 33 feet high diving board staring me down. I freaked out. Perhaps some of you can relate. I looked to the instructor, I said, excuse me, sir, do I have to jump off that thing? He said, as a matter of fact, Cadet Waldman, you do. You don't even graduate the academy and have any chance of being a pilot unless you complete water survival training and jump off that diving board with a 35-pound pack on your back. And my mouth got parched dry as I thought, this was not in a darn marketing brochure. <laughs> I jumped off that diving board, folks, last in my entire class to do it because there was no way in the heck, John that I was gonna let 33 feet stand between me and living my dreams. Life isn't always in the brochure, is it? You see, I jumped, made a commitment to excellence, and I graduated the Air Force Academy and was fortunate enough to be in the top 33% and I got to go to pilot training. And in pilot training, you have to compete with your peers and there's always a limited number of slots for fighter pilots. And they were cutting back in around 1990 when I graduated. So I graduated at the top of my class, but I wasn't number one. And there was only one fighter slot. And Captain Andy Toth got that fighter. I hate that guy. <laughs> and so I took the next best thing which was to be an instructor pilot. I didn't want to be a tanker or a heavy pilot and be travel the world in these big cockpits and be bored. I wanted to be pulling G's and flying formation and, 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 and learning how to do maneuvers. And so I decided to be an instructor and teach young men and women how to fly. And the key was I would recompete after three or four years of that instructor tour, get rank ordered, and I'd have another shot at choosing my jet, hopefully choosing my dream F-16. 
and everything was going great for me. I was loving instructing. And then around two years into my flying career, I had a missile shot at me. Had nothing to do with flying at first. I decided to go scuba diving with a couple of my buddies. Uh, it was in the Caribbean, never been before, and I'm thinking, how hard could it be? You put your mask on, go in the water and swim, but five seconds into the water, I was wishing I paid just a little more attention to the mission briefing. Because I'm flailing like an idiot, I'm using my arms instead of my legs, totally improper technique, and my muscles begin to ache from head to toe. I can't move, frozen. And then I start sinking in the water. 10, 20, 30 feet. My mask inadvertently separates and I inhale a whole lungful of burning, stinging salt water. I'll never forget the feeling. My lungs felt like they were on fire and I began to choke into the mask. I freaked out, wondering if I was going to inhale more, more water. And then I had something called a panic attack. Didn't know what one was up until that moment. Thought I was going to die. No combat mission could come close to that day. And I got out of the water and said, I'm never doing that again. And a few days later, I'm back in the jet flying a training mission, and the weather was terrible. Madison, Wisconsin, terrible, right? Thunderstorms, lightning, clouds everywhere. Couldn't see the sun, couldn't see the ground. And I started to panic again. I got really anxious and became lightheaded. I looked down at the oxygen. I'm like, there's something wrong with the oxygen. I got to land this plane. But I realized there was nothing wrong with the oxygen, but there was everything wrong with me. As I became panicked again and experienced the same claustrophobic panic attack that I had a few days prior, but instead of being 35 feet under the water, now I'm 35,000 feet in the air. Like, I'm claustrophobic. Probably not the best thing for a pilot to have, would you guys agree? And so when I came back to the squadron, the next time I strapped into the plane to fly, and basically for the next eight years, I had to deal with this fear and this phobia, this uncertainty and doubt that threatened to paralyze my ability to do what I love more than anything else. I would go out on these training missions freaking out. It was like jumping off at 33 feet high diving boards every single day. I was panicked. My fear became greater than my passion, and I became doubtful and uncertain and full of fear. And I'm like, how am I going to do this? Now, no one knew about this fear that I had, and I, I, it wasn't impacting my ability to fly. I was still able to do my job, but there were times when I'd come back from some of these training missions with these wings on my hand saying, I can't do this anymore. This sucks. And by the time I walked into that squadron, I put these wings back on and I said, one more day, one more day, just get into that jet. And it became easier and easier for me. But I had a secret weapon. You see, when I strapped into that plane to teach these young men and women how to fly, my associates, so to, so to speak, I became maniacally focused on them. How can I teach them? How can I instruct them and serve them and help them live their dreams of putting these wings on their chest, which is one of the most amazing things that can happen in the military? I eventually became the number one instructor in my squadron. Number one out of 300, 308 other pilots. They ranked me at the top. So it came down to assignment night, and my commander said, congratulations, Waldo, you did it. You're at the top of your class. You can choose anything you want. The C-17, the brand new four-engine cargo plane, travel the world, big roomy cockpit, Take a nap in the back, be bored out of your mind, or choose that F-16, the jet of your dreams, Waldo, Mach 2, 9 Gs, 8-hour night combat missions in a tiny little cockpit, barely able to move. And I had this choice to make. Do I choose the C-17 or choose the F-16? Do I play it safe? and take the easy way out or push it up. And you know which one I chose. 
You see, I didn't want to have to look back on my life and tell my son, who's now nine years old, guess what? Your dad had a dream to fly the F-16, and as soon as he had the choice to choose it, make the tough choice, he quit. He took the easy way out. Don't do as your dad does, son. Face your fear. Take the road less travel, because on the opposite side of that fear is growth. What I'm challenging you to do is to choose your F-16 every single day, to make that tough choice to realize that we're gonna have some headwinds and turbulence and life is gonna come at us and we're gonna be full of fear and doubt. That's normal, that's part of earning your wings as a leader, the scars of character that your teammates don't see. And the choice that you make, the example that you set for your kids, for your associates, for your country, for your community. That's the key, that's the juice. And I'm asking you to think about what that is to you. The, the, the green smoothie or the donut, the snooze, or to get out of bed and hit the gym. The tough conversation, or maybe to pull it back. Not say anything to somebody that needs to hear your truth. To push it up or pull it back. And this is how we grow, folks. And if I, face my fears and deal with my claustrophobia and fly eight-hour combat missions in a tighter little cockpit that I believe that you can do anything. So here's my challenge for you. Choose that F-16. Set the example for yourself and for your teammates and build that courage and credibility and confidence that it takes to lead with authenticity and serve your women every day.